Hello, it's Anna Pacheco, SantaFe101.com. My guest today is Kyle um, Harwood, and he is an expert with anything to do with water. But uh, Kyle, do I have your permission to record this interview? You most certainly do. Thank you. And if you can please give me your official title, that would be better. Uh, I'm a partner at the law firm of Eagle for Lake Martinez and Harwood, where I specialize in water resources and New Mexico water law. I'm the head of our land and water practice group here at the firm. Excellent. And we would mentioning, uh, can you mention that interesting photo that's right behind you? Sure, that's a satellite photo of the Santa Fe area. Um, it is centered on Santa Fe. And when I was at the city attorney's office doing work with the Sangre de Cristo Water Division and the elected officials on the Santa Fe Council, I used to joke that everything I was working on was on that picture. Uh, the west side of it is bounded on the Valle Caldera, the east side on the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, and it runs basically from Hamas Dam down outside of Bernalillo up to um, the confluence of the Chama and the Rio Grande north of uh, Española. And we could pick out the canyon reservoirs that are behind Santa Fe. You can see Las Campanas, which has always been a big water topic in Santa Fe, as well as uh, my neighborhood in La Cienega and many other areas that folks familiar with Santa Fe will, will recognize. But it's uh, as I was mentioning to you before we started, uh, former mayor Larry Delgado, who hired me and who I worked for for many years, had a duplicate copy of this uh, picture on his uh, office wall. If I remember correctly, he may have actually taken it home with him when he was done. So small very, town Santa Fe, as you know. A very interesting. And so... Um, uh, you were actually recommended to me uh, from a realtor that I should definitely interview because here in New Mexico, because this, you know, this website is primarily about, you know, people wanting to move to New Mexico. And sure. even, you know, this, Santa Fe is my hometown. I, you know, my family's been here for, you know, 333 years. And even as a little kid, I remember saying, well, they can't build anymore because there's no water. And, you know, that was back in the day. I mean, the, the, the area of El Dorado didn't exist. There were no houses there. I mean, when I was growing, I mean, this Santa Fe has probably tripled in size since I was a little girl here. So let's talk about uh, your, you know, what you've encountered in terms of, of, of water resources. And, I, and then we can talk about that big case that was going on for the long time, the Amit case. So let's just talk a little bit about water in case people are thinking of moving here, what they might be up against or what they should be at least be aware of. Okay, great. Well, this is one of my favorite topics. I'll try to keep it um easily digestible because water law can get fairly complicated very quickly. So um, let me start by saying that the reason you got referred to me by a realtor is it's been my honor to teach the New Mexico water law class for the Real Estate Commission for about, I think it's about the last seven years. So I've had hundreds of real estate professionals through the four hour water law class that I teach for the Real Estate Commission. And um, I feel like it's really important to have realtors informed about water, primarily because they're on the front lines of people moving if they're, if they're here in Santa Fe, but also very uh, importantly, if you have people moving to Santa Fe from elsewhere who may have only heard about uh, Western water law or uh, the kinds of issues that come up regu regularly, uh, particularly in Northern New Mexico. So, when I started at the city of Santa Fe in 2002, we, we Santa Fe, uh, the, Santa, the Santa Fe metropolitan area, which of course is made up of the city and county of Santa Fe, was coming out of a particularly bad drought. Um, it was so bad at that time that the city manager had actually ordered that irrigation supplies to the city parks be uh, limited in order to make sure we had enough drinking water and fire protection. And so some people will remember that city parks went dry that summer. And that was a real wake up call for both the professionals that work on water, but also the community. And the story of the last almost 20 years since uh, the early 2000s is a really remarkable story. And it's partly because of the individual decisions that Santa Feans have made about conserving water, uh, putting in water reuse projects, harvesting water from rooftops, 
uh, valuing and maintaining the acequias, which are the surface water ditches that supply water to, um, to irrigation uh, demand throughout uh, the city and the surrounding areas. And also, so that's the decrease in demand part of it. We've also increased the resilience of the water production um, facilities that provide water to, to the city and county of Santa Fe. And so the story of the last uh, 20 years has been a really significant um, financial and infrastructure investment in what I call water resilience. That's a common term among water professionals. And that's our ability to manage the bounty of water when it's available, but even more importantly, to manage the uh, drought of water when mother nature doesn't provide the um, kinds of water that we've uh, uh, hoped for or become accustomed to. And so um, I'm gonna try out this little um, kind of analogy for you and, and see if it makes sense. You can obviously let me know if it's not making sense, but um, 20 years ago, it took one gallon of groundwater and one gallon of surface water to meet each gallon of demand in the greater Santa Fe area. And so when we had a drought, when the reservoirs up above Santa Fe, the McClure and Nichols reservoirs on the Santa Fe River, when they had almost no water in them, uh, we would turn to groundwater pumping and we would have a real scarcity of supply during those years. Well, since, since that time, the city invested in uh, four new deep wells between the city and the Rio Grande called Buckman 10 through 13. And then the city and county in Las Campanas coordinated on a very ambitious project to divert Rio Grande surface water and treat it and deliver it into the combined system. So it's a three to $400 million investment over these last 20 years. I should also say the city has been working very hard on upgrading. Uh, it has two other well fields that it has uh, made significant investments in. And so you fast forward to today and now there is one gallon of groundwater and a gallon of surface water to meet each gallon of demand. So we could supply everything in town just on surface water, if that surface water is available. And in a drought year, if that surface water is not available, there's now sufficient infrastructure and water rights to supply every gallon of demand through just groundwater. So I don't know if that makes sense, that sort of um, snippet that I've shared, but 20 years ago, it took one gallon of groundwater plus one gallon of surface water to meet one gallon of demand. And today we have one gallon of groundwater to meet a gallon of demand, and we have a gallon of surface water to meet each gallon of demand. And that represents a really, really big change in the water resilience of Santa Fe. The other thing I'll mention is that, you know, some 78% of water in New Mexico is used to support agriculture. And so when you look at our total water budget by region, um, there are some real issues with moving water around or treating it to drinking water standards. But what we have right now, when we think about not having enough water for new houses, is a very small reduction in agricultural use of water, which is its own set of very complex social and economic issues, uh, would, would actually free up a su substantial water for both current residents and future residents. And that's just a matter of math. I mean, there are obviously political, economic, social issues that go into converting water use. I don't mean to diminish that at all. I, I represent a lot of the Asakias in my current practice and, and defending and protecting the Asakia tradition is very important. But when you just look at it as a math uh, issue, um, it takes a lot of water to grow stuff in the desert. And we have learned you can get by supplying really very small amounts of water to new construction if it's built properly with a water mindset, low flow fixtures, water reuse, water harvesting, some of those things I mentioned at the very beginning. 
And so let's talk about water rights. I mean, I know that I, I heard this like years ago that uh, you could you could buy water rights that were several miles away, but to use them like in Santa Fe or something. Can you explain that to me? Sure. So the state engineer manages the interconnected surface and groundwater resources in what are called hydrologic units. So if you have water that's in a hydrologic unit, you are allowed under the state statutes and regulations to move that water use around. One thing you cannot do, for example, is you can't discontinue a use of water up in Farmington on the San Juan River system and ask the state engineer for permission to divert that water in Santa Fe in the Rio Grande system because those are two river systems that don't talk to each other, they don't connect. So that kind of water rate transfer uh, is not allowed. Um, you can move water rights though in a hydrologic unit. And so, <clears throat> for example, the city and county of Santa Fe having have encouraged or required new development to bring water rights to um, the city and county infrastructure in Santa Fe. And many of those water rights have come from below Cochiti, down around Albuquerque, south of Albuquerque, down in Socorro, because that whole Rio Grande section is a hydrologic unit. So to divert the water here up at Buckman, which is an old town site down on the Rio Grande, below Los Alamos and west of Santa Fe, to divert a water right down there on the Rio Grande is water that would have flowed past Buckman and been used on a field somewhere downstream. So, when you think about moving water rights around, it's very important to understand the hydrologic unit. Uh, let me mention something else that is often very um, confusing and the source of a lot of consternation, which is a lot of Northern New Mexico is worried that Santa Fe and Albuquerque will move water rights from Chama or Taos or Velarde. And actually, while that is still a hydrologic unit, there's a barrier right in the middle, which is called the Odui Gauge, which is where, if you're familiar with the road that goes up to, up to Los Alamos, it's where it crosses the Rio Grande. And the reason why that gauge is so important is because it's actually the gauge that was selected back in the late 1920s and early 1930s when Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas met here in Santa Fe, actually, at Bishop's Lodge to negotiate how to divide up the Rio Grande flow. And so this is what does New Mexico expect Colorado to deliver? And what does Texas expect New Mexico to deliver to Texas? And that gauge was decided in that agreement, which was ratified by Congress, that that gauge would be the measuring point, uh, one, of, one of several measuring points, but the most important one for New Mexico. And so effectively, you can't move water rights across that gauge because to do so would mean changing a congressional act uh, because the math that goes into that agreement is measured at that point. So we have um, a hydrologic unit, obviously the Rio Grande and the Chama, but there's this uh, congressional uh, break in this hydrologic unit that creates two systems, one above Odui, which is Cochiti and everything downstream, and the other is everything upstream, which is, um, you know, the, the, the Pewaukee Nam Bay system, the areas around Española, and then the areas that go up uh, the Chama and the Rio Grande to the state lines. So the long and the short of it is that northern New Mexico need not worry that Santa Fe and Albuquerque, as they continue to grow, are going to be taking their water from them. Is that correct? The water rights cannot be moved below the gauge for diversion. The one little exception that some people up in Taos will be familiar with is that Santa Fe County did buy some water rights north of Taos and moved them down to the new utility that's getting built right now to supply the, um, the Nambe Tasuki Pewaukee Basin, which is the Amet case, which we'll, I think we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. And so that water right transfer. So that diversion for that utility is just above Odui. So those transfers from Taos can come down to that point because it's still above Odui. And so I won't, I don't wanna, um, again, this stuff gets very fairly complicated fairly quickly, but I don't want anybody listening to this uh, to, to assume that there aren't 
sort of edges of of things that 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 kind of deviate from the general rule. But generally speaking, you can't move the diversion of water rights in northern New Mexico. You can't move that point of diversion below the gauge. Um, since Santa Fe County is sort of both sides of the gauge, obviously, because Santa Fe County runs all the way up to Española, uh, Santa Fe County has moved some northern New Mexico water rights down for that uh, brand new utility that's getting built right now. Um, this is a, a big project just north of Santa Fe. It's going to really change the supply of water in those basins between Santa Fe and Española, and it comes at the end of a the longest running federal court case in the country um, it was a case that was filed in the mid 1960s and was only settled a couple of years ago. Um, and so. And so what was, I just remember you, um, I just remember reading about it, it just went on forever and ever and ever in the paper. But yes. so you were, you were the, were you the lead attorney on that case or you were involved for sure? I was involved. Um, I actually worked for the federal court after law school on the case. Uh, then when I joined the city of Santa Fe, I was assigned to the case because the city of Santa Fe had some interests in uh, the adjudication of water north of, of Santa Fe. And since I've left the city, I've had other roles um, with that case. Um, and these days I represent a lot of um, uh, buyers and sellers of property in the basin because the the rules that have been imposed in that basin are, are among the most complex rules that we see anywhere in the western United States. Um, so, and the uh, water, so for instance, yeah, tell me what, like if somebody wants to buy a house, they have to fight for the water or when they sell a house, tell me what that would mean. Um, you if you're buying and, yeah. Yeah, if, if you're buying and selling property, uh, existing pro property that's been built on, then what we do is evaluate the, the groundwater well right or the surface water acequia right uh, for a buyer to make sure that the buyer can continue the activities that they see the seller doing. Can they irrigate that field? Is there well in compliance for supplying the house? This becomes a much bigger issue if you're buying or selling vacant land in the basin because one of the almost unheard of rules that has been uh, has been agreed to and imposed in the Nambe Pawaki Tasuki Valley is that there can be no new domestic wells um, under the domestic well statute. So the domestic well statute statewide says that if you have a legal lot of record, you can get a domestic well permit to supply that home. In the in the Amet Basin, or the otherwise known the MPT Basin, the Nambe Pawaki Tasuki Basin, you can no longer get a domestic well under that domestic well statute. The only way you can get a domestic a new domestic well in the basin today is to buy and retire an existing water right in the basin. So that put a lot of pressure on the water right market in that area, and um, that is only one of about several dozen very important rules uh, that have been imposed in that basin in order to meet the settlement agreement and the congressional act. So bear in mind, this lawsuit was um, primarily driven by the, the need and the desire to quantify the Pueblo water rights in the basin. And so also resolved all of the non-Pueblo rights in the basin as well. And you're referring and, to Nambe Pueblo, correct? Well, it's the it's called the Amit case because it's uh, named after the first defendant in the basin, which is alphabetical. So there is an individual by the name of Lee Amit. Uh, his name starts double A M O D T. He's of Eastern European heritage. He was a scientist up at Los Alamos National Labs. But what has been referred to as the Amit case is the adjudication of the water rights in the Nambe, Pawaki, and Tasuki stream systems, which involves well, four three pueblos. So the three pueblos of Powake, Nambe, and Tesuque, it would affect, it affects those three pueblos? It affects those three watersheds. It actually affects four pueblos because San Aldefonso is the fourth pueblo in the basin. So who was, who was suing who then? Was the Amit people suing who, the federal government or who was suing who? So the way a water right adjudication case is, um, 
docketed is actually the state engineer sues all the water right owners in the basin. And so you had 6,000 defendants named or something at the very beginning. And it was literally every Asakia water right holder and every groundwater well water right holder, as well as the Pueblos were named as defendants because a water right adjudication is a lot like what we call a quiet title suit to property. So if you have some muddle of deeds and easements that relate to, you know, the corner of Don Gaspar and Guadalupe or whatever, like if you have a bunch of complicated documents for a piece of property, you bring what's called a quiet title suit to a judge and you publish it in the newspaper and you say, anybody that's got an interest come forward. If you don't come forward by a certain time, you will lose your opportunity to argue your position in as we quiet title to that dirt. Well, a water right adjudication is the same kind of proceeding for all of the water rights in the basin. So it says, hear ye, hear ye, everyone who thinks they have a water right must come forward. The state engineer joins every single water right owner in the basin in the lawsuit and then the water rates are adjudicated. And very often, instead of going, uh, very often there's a settlement agreement that's sort of created along the way because you're trying to balance out so many different interests with water. So, uh, settlement agreements are often the way you can sort of balance all those issues out. So we have a water rate settlement agreement up in Taos called the Abeta case. There's the uh, adjudication of the Santa Fe River, which is called the Anaya case, which was filed in the 1970s, but has been dormant and incomplete for the last couple of decades. Um, but there are these various, uh, there's the Aragon case, which is uh, the Rio Chama. Uh, you know, there's all these different um, adjudications of stream basins and uh, and that's how that that's how that generally works. So, and so they, how was the they, Amit case settled? Did did the did the people that filed the lawsuit did they win, or the settlement was that okay? No one, we're just not going to let anybody else um, uh, dig a new well, or how did that kind of how did that end up? The Amit settlement um, concluded with a fairly complicated settlement agreement and congressional act, where the pueblos agreed to forego some of their more aggressive claims to the water in the basin in exchange for federal money to build a brand new utility that would divert and treat Rio Grande surface water and supply it to the domestic needs and the fire protection uh, requirements in the basin. And that is, that is, a, that is a fairly typical a solution even outside of New Mexico, particularly where Indian water right claims are at issue. So very often the Pueblo or the Indian claims start out claiming almost all the water in a basin because they are the first, historically been the first users, but then they sort of exchange some of that, some of those claims for a federal project that brings sort of new water into the basin for everyone to use. So it's the same way the San Juan adjudication has been settled with respect to the Navajo claims. It's similar to what's happened in Taos where Taos has claimed, originally Taos Pueblo claimed much of the water in the basin, but then there was a settlement agreement that allowed for the town and the acequias and the mutual domestics uh, water associations up there to to continue so it it becomes a bit of a bit of a jockeying at the beginning for position and then everyone sort of realizes that there's a solution that's kind of outside of the judge's authority uh, so people sit down and they come up with a settlement agreement and when tribes are involved it often involves the federal government and then what most of the time folks realize is that it's better to shake hands on a mutual solution and then they go out and seek the funding that's needed for the settlement agreement. It's a, it's a fairly typical progression, but it does start with the claims of all the parties informing their negotiating position and then you see the settlement agreement coming out on the back end.
Oh, good. Well, you know, we're out of time now in the interview, but I wanted to just ask you as an attorney who's been working on this for many, many years, you're an expert. What is your feeling about, um, you know, New Mexico's continuing to grow? I mean, as is most parts of the West here. What is your feeling about uh, the whole water issue and in population, you know, growth? I mean, it, I, I think the population of New Mexico has literally doubled since I was a little girl here. So what do you think? Well, I think that, um, so I have a family who's growing up here in Santa Fe, and I certainly hope my young children will have uh, a beautiful place to live as I have had um, here. I think that um, the demands that humans are putting on the water system for domestic water use are quite small relative to the water budget. I think the much bigger uncertainties have to do with water for endangered species, which um, is, a very, is a very real constraint imposed by federal law and obviously reflects a lot of very important societal interests and, and, and healthy environment goals. And then uh, regardless of how you feel about the science of global warming, which um, is a whole different conversation, we do know that the hydrologic cycle is changing. Um, the runoffs are happening earlier. Um, we are getting bigger swings in water availability year to year. So we'll have bigger big years and smaller small years. And that is a real challenge to the dams and reservoir systems that we have. And so I would say on balance, the growth of human uh, domestic water needs are real and they're expensive because treating water to drinking water standards is a takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot of technology. But the much bigger um, issues that I see affecting water uh, management, water resource administration, um, go to well, first of all, the unresolved claims of the. Indians, the Indian entities that have not gotten settlement agreements. So it's important to realize that there are a bunch of Pueblos in the Middle Valley uh, between Cochiti and Elephant Butte um, who've not had their water rights quantified at all. And then you have the endangered species issues and then the, change, the changes to the hydrologic cycle that are pretty unclear still, that those are much bigger issues than do we approve this subdivision or is there enough water to bring uh, you know another industry to las lunas right now i don't know if you know but in the paper the last two weeks has been water for a facebook center down in los lunas those are all real issues for each community but the size of the water that's being demanded by those kinds of projects is is very very small relative to the size of the whole water budget or the variation that we see from year to year so those are those are much bigger sorts of issues when i think about um the the big picture Okay. Well, you know, um, I, I think that we probably will have to have you back on the show again, because there's a lot more to talk about, but we are out of time now. I guess the one thing I do want to say is when I was growing up here, you know, and I was a teenager and stuff, people would come here and they'd start having like, you know, lawns and, and that's been a, the good thing about in the last 30 to 40 years is people don't try to do that anymore for the most part. I mean, people have, it's called zero scaping or they're trying their best. So they realize that they're living in New Mexico. They're not in Philadelphia any longer and they can't have these lush green lawns and different things. So I think in a little, you know, th those little baby steps have to help as well. But again, I want to thank you for, uh, for lending your expertise to this this uh, very complex issue. And again, maybe we can, we can do another show on another aspect of it down the road. What do you think? Sure. Be happy to anything. Uh, I, I, I love sharing what, I, what little I know about the world and I'd be happy to help in any way. Well, I think you know a lot about New Mexico water rights. Listen again, thank you and we'll be in touch. Take care. You too.